The first topic of the video is one that I feel like perfectly kicks off Nickelodeon Lost Media for the fact that it originates from some of their earliest years of being formed into a network. The topic itself is actually kind of scary and mysterious. There's not a lot of information even being available about it, and I'm kind of surprised this wasn't discussed all those years ago, though maybe it wasn't known about back then. This topic is called Video Dream Theater, and just like its name illustrates, it dates back to some of the earliest years of Nickelodeon in 1979. This is a period of time where Nickelodeon didn't have original programming and would often get content from other places and repackage it for television. Nickelflix and Pinwheel are among the two most well-known examples, the latter of which is where the infamous Clockman short originally aired on the channel. However, in an effort to create some original content for Nickelodeon, and in their first attempt, Geraldine Laybourne was hired to create two original pilots that would be aired under the Video Dream Theater header. According to an interview with Geraldine in an article written for CableCenter.org, she goes on to describe the concept of this show and some of its content by stating, Video Dream Theater was a send-in dream program that we did for Nickelodeon. One was with Julie Taymor, where we used her masks in one of the dreams of our kids, and another one was using Color Xerox animation. Based on this recollection, there were a total of two animations produced for this series, with the intention of making more, by way of kids sending in their own dreams, as a concept. So it sounds like there was a little interaction with the viewers too, which is a really cool idea. But as the story goes, Nickelodeon did not end up airing these pieces of animation back in the day, or launching Video Dream Theater at all, because of the difficulty producing each short and the overall low expectations for the series. Geraldine goes on to say that sometimes kids' dreams are really scary and dark, with themes about abandonment and other intense issues that don't make good stories, and this in turn would be hard to market towards that audience. Not to mention from some of their studies at the time, it was too hard for kids to make the jump from watching something goofy like Scooby-Doo to a surrealist concept like this, and the Lost Media Wiki article even states that the short's response was negative during some test screenings. Nick had to reevaluate their idea, and the whole project ended up being scrapped. Neither pilot ever aired on TV, and there is so little information about it that the recollections from Geraldine are some of the only remaining online. It's not even known if the pilots still exist, given how long ago they were produced, and how obscure they've become. In fact, the Lost Media Wiki article itself doesn't even have any visuals to represent it. This is a pretty rare sight to see on the website and there aren't a whole lot of articles that sport that missing film reel artwork in the first place. Nickelodeon wouldn't launch their first original animated programs until 1991, so a lot of time existed between when Video Dream Theater was made and when original animation was revisited. I'm sure it would be basically impossible to get a hold of these anywhere outside of Nick's archives, which might not even contain them in the first place. It would be cool to see some early lost media from the channel to celebrate one of their anniversaries, so maybe they can dig around and re-release them for a future event. It wouldn't be a rare Nickelodeon lost media video without at least one topic from Spongebob. Actually, there are a lot of new lost topics from that series I want to talk about, but we'll save the majority of them for another video. For now, let's discuss a piece of lost media that quite literally fits the definition of rare because it's so rare that we're not even sure if it exists or not. Now normally I wouldn't be putting an existence unconfirmed topic in a video like this that covers more traditional lost media, but the response to this post seems to be overwhelmingly in favor that it does exist, and that other people besides OP remember it, which caught me by surprise, as the topic is very strange considering its nature. On the Lost Media Wiki forums, during one of my live streams, a new thread showed up that immediately caught my attention for how ridiculous it sounded, and originally, I clicked it just to see how fake it could be. The thread's title is Spongebob Intro with Pear and Live Action Band. I was expecting it to be a really long, complicated recollection that only contains vague memories or something that seemed so fake, but to my surprise it was much more defined. The thread goes on to state that in some time between 2006 and 2009, user Jinteg has a very distinct memory of watching Nickelodeon and seeing a strange intro of Spongebob play. They go on to describe how it started, stating, It had a strange intro. Instead of Painty the Pirate, the painted pirate who says, Are you ready, kids? 
there was a painting of a pear without any dialogue. This then cut to a CGI model of Spongebob's house, with a live action band superimposed onto it. They were wearing plaid and played a unique version of the theme song. While some doubt is expressed by OP about its legitimacy, mentioning that it could have been something they dreamt up, which is never a good sign in topics like these. The more I looked into the replies and discussed it live on the stream with viewers, the more people seem to recall this, or having seen something similar. Jintag firstly mentioned that there are old Reddit threads that discuss a similar topic, which led to other people chiming in, trying to better deduce what it could be. These guesses ranged anywhere, from something like a special promo or one-off, some kind of parody animation that wasn't actually official, having originated from the internet, or an alternate opening of the show for some kind of event. In my opinion, if this really exists, it seems extremely likely that it would be some kind of one-off or special promo that was aired very few times, since Spongebob is no stranger to that kind of content having been made. The Summer Splash block, for example, had an entire series of new animations, a large majority of which are still missing. And even something like the Got Milk commercial was very specific and very hard to find, even after having proof that it existed in the first place. Jinteg goes on to say that they've been able to confirm what it's definitely not from, two of which mention it wasn't something created for a ride or theme park, as well as it not being an alternate language dub. According to them, it was aired on regular Nickelodeon, and that's allegedly where they saw it. There's not much else that gets discussed on here, other than more guesses, but even after my doubts surrounding the topic were made clear on that live stream, there still seemed to be a good handful of people in the chat who really recalled it as well. It wasn't collectively debunked as fake. Which is what's so surprising to me about this topic, and makes me change my tune on it a little bit. We've seen so many Spongebob topics, that fortune cookie promo that I covered a couple months ago, being one of the latest examples, where there's so much doubt surrounding its existence, it feels more fake than it does real. But for some reason, this one feels more real to more people, and that leads us in a more positive direction. My advice, of course, would be something along the lines of looking through recordings from the 2006 to 2009 time period and hoping that something shows up. But I would be surprised to find out this is already on YouTube and is just hiding. It's probably going to take someone finding a confirmed sighting of it somewhere online and using those dates just to narrow in on when it could have been aired, and better locate a time period from where we can get a possible recording from. Here's a series that I never thought I'd be talking about again, because I actually didn't know there was any more lost media from the series still left. But over the years, I've been told of a spin-off Nicktoon that never saw the light of day, and is actually pretty obscure, despite having come from a previously popular series. This main series that we'll be talking about is none other than the Angry Beavers, which got its fame from within the lost media community as a result of the search for the lost pilots from the series that were conducted many years ago. First, there was Snowbound, the original pilot that saw the beavers trapped inside during a snowstorm. People knew about this one, but it took a bootleg DVD that for some reason had the episode on it for this to be unearthed. And the second, which is the more infamous of the two, is called Cup Together. This one had the beavers cup together after Daggett destroyed an expensive statue. But despite the claims of international viewers having seen the episode, it never existed according to creator Mitch Schauer, who finally ended up making a statement on it. But in addition to these two pilots, there was actually a third Beavers pilot that was created. And no, it's not fake, not even directly related to the main series, but rather a spin-off series that unfortunately never really took shape. This is titled Simply Sisters, and was an entire series that was going to feature Norbert and Daggett's sisters named Stacy and Chelsea, named after Mitch Shower's own daughters. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about the pilot itself online, like what the plot was supposed to be, or what the vision for the whole series was. But it seems like, more or less, it would just be the beavers with female protagonists, though that would still give the concept a whole new feel. Most of the information we have about the show comes from Mitch Shower himself, who was interviewed by Old School Lane six years ago, and discusses a little bit more about the project. Actually, at the end of the series, we did a pilot uh, called Simply Sisters with them doing the voices. We were going to do a spinoff show with the sisters <clears throat> and then have the Beavers guest star once in a while. Oh, wow. uh, and it, we, it turned out really well. It, it's a, it's a well-done pilot. 
the quality of it's really nice. And we had uh, uh, Shirley Walker do the music, who was responsible for a lot of the uh, Warner's Batman music. And she did a beautiful job. And uh, I, I really had high hopes that that would spin off because uh, I, I thought, well, we've done guys, let's do some girls now. Mitch then goes on to describe a really interesting approach to the creation of the series by hiring an all-female crew to help produce it. But he doesn't say anything about doing this simply to make some kind of progressive statement about the workplace, and rather, to increase the quality of the show. He states that by having an all-female crew create the show, it would give it a more authentic feel, beyond all the stereotypical things that girls do, like putting on mom's makeup, as he says. Mitch also stated that it was narrated by Alyssa Milano, who plays one of the sisters grown up as an adult. So maybe the pilot begins with the sisters being older and recollecting their younger days. That's not entirely known though, because the pilot wasn't picked up for a full series and it's never been released or seen by anyone outside of Nickelodeon. As you heard Mitch say in the interview, it was finalized and in his opinion, of really high quality, so at least we can confirm it does exist in that way. I can't remember exactly when I first heard about this topic, but I recall believing it was only a storyboard or concept art at first. A cancelled spin-off series from a show that already had one fake pilot didn't sound too promising, but once having found out that the whole package was completed, I was really shocked to hear it had been kept so well under wraps. Not even a single screenshot from it showed up anywhere, and there really aren't a lot of people even talking about it in general. Considering most of its mentions come from Mitch himself or other animation related content, it doesn't really seem like a topic that has really left that sphere. I wonder if there's any way this could make its way out to the public, especially if Mitch is so proud of the work he put into it. Of course that's assuming he has a copy. Of course if he doesn't have one, that would lead to a whole separate search in itself. The Angry Beavers wiki says that Mario and Diana storyboarded the pilot and has a cassette copy of the audio, but I'm not sure where this information comes from. There's no source. If anything, it leads me to believe that other crew might have content from it, so if Mitch doesn't there are other options to explore. But we'll have to get more information about its whereabouts to determine who has a copy and if it can even be released in the first place. It's fair to say that Nickelodeon has been at the forefront of experimental content compared to the likes of other channels like Cartoon Network or Disney. And just by looking through their programming history, you can find quite a lot of unique shows that don't really have counterparts on other networks. But because so much content exists in this way, it's likely that some of it is going to become forgotten about or lost entirely. But no matter the case, it's always bizarre to discover that a program that aired on national TV has become so obscure that recollections of it barely exist and recordings of it are even fewer. This topic is a perfect example of that and dates all the way back to 1992, when a documentary style show would air on Nickelodeon, called Beyond Belief. It was hosted by Jay Potter, and covers a wide variety of interesting facts about the world, though apparently only ran for a couple of years, ending in 1994, and was so forgotten about, that one of its only mentions online was from an IMDB page, in addition to a few TV guides that had been archived from back in the day. But then in 2018, the first modern mention of this show would begin on Reddit, when user Me McCarty stated, I'm wondering if any of you remember this show, not to be confused with the fact or fiction iteration that followed later. It was a documentary style program. I've been looking for a video for a while and came up with nothing. This was posted six years ago and prompted a response from another user who said they had also been trying to find it for years, suggesting that the time frame it aired in was really early on Saturday mornings and remembering the show for how it usually covered creepy topics like tombs or catacombs. This early airtime would be a reasonable explanation as to why the show became forgotten about, as there would be far fewer people watching Nick early in the morning, so less people would remember it existing. Though according to another post, apparently it was moved to that time slot after debuting at 1.30pm, but it seems like it wasn't popular at all given that half of its run was early in the morning. So with its obscurity and unpopularity, it's going to be hard getting any footage. In fact, it seems like ever since this thread had been made, there were only bits of discussion and memories about watching the show. No one really found any content from it, until someone in this thread from two years ago pointed out that an upload had been made to YouTube in 2020, containing a nearly complete episode from Beyond Belief. Coincidentally, it's one that does talk about catacombs, and to date is the only content from the show that's made its way online, 
despite having been on TV for two years. There is a separate upload of some bumpers from the show, but they seem to come from this original upload, as it has the commercial breaks included. While the show seems like it's well produced and informative, I can see how it would become forgotten by most people, even disregarding how long it was on air for. Still, it's a cool piece of Nickelodeon history, and maybe with more awareness spread about it, more content from it will resurface. The last topic of the video is one that I suppose can't really have a search conducted for it, not because the topic doesn't exist, but because it's so broad it would be hard to say what's found from it and what's still lost. Still, it's something that could exist in the form of media, and connects to a larger point about preservation in the first place, all of which we'd never even known about if it wasn't for a single auction that I accidentally found. If there's one thing that I've noticed over the many years of researching Nickelodeon and the people who made the cartoons, it's that they cared about preserving their time at the company and the history of what happened in it. We saw this on full display in the Nickelodeon Animation Studios employee yearbook that documented a whole plethora of content, from photographs showing the construction of the studio itself, to details about the employees, and all the little quirks of the office in between. It's not something that was made for the public to see and was mostly made for them, but over the years, as the books have left the hands of their original owners, it gives us the fans an inside look at what the company was like back then. Not only that, but there are lots of videos online showing the studio, and I'm glad these exist as a way to preserve the company's history. And by complete accident, I came upon another event that as far as I can tell, doesn't have any documentation or content from it that's resurfaced which is surprising considering it's from Nick's biggest show. A few months ago, I was browsing old eBay auctions on WorthPoint just to see if I could find something interesting or a new piece of lost media that we could be on the lookout for. And this is when I came across a listing from a former employee of the studio who was selling off their entire collection of memorabilia. This collection contained a whole bunch of promotional content, ranging from media to accessories to toys, all of which was only made for the employees. And then in the back was an item that really caught my attention. It was a big beach towel, which depicted the SpongeBob SquarePants logo over an orange background, with text to the side that reads, Nickelodeon Family and Friends Day, July 24th, 1999, SpongeBob SquarePants Premiere Party. Based on the wording seen in this towel, it sounds like Nickelodeon ran some kind of community event that celebrated SpongeBob's premiere. Considering this towel was from the collection of an employee, it sounds like it was some kind of real-life company event and not something the general public would have been invited to. But still, I had never heard about any kind of event like this before, especially for something related to SpongeBob. But it piqued my interest so much, I gave it a Google search, trying to dig up anything on the topic, but I didn't find anything. There's nothing about a Nickelodeon Family and Friends Day online, nothing about a Spongebob premiere party, and I couldn't even find another towel that looked like this one. In a sense, this towel is an artifact from a point in time that has no tangible recording of ever happening. Of course, we can assume that it did happen, I'm sure the event wasn't cancelled, or that these towels were made to advertise something that never happened in the first place. But when you think about it, this topic is not something that we can necessarily archive or label as found, but it's something that I'm interested in learning more about. And actually, while I was editing this video, I did find more documentation of the event. A ticket that was made for it was posted online. This looks like the first of its kind to be shared, and is exactly what I mean when I talk about the need to preserve this kind of media. Looking through that Nickelodeon yearbook was so fascinating, and I'd love to know more about what this party was like. Did they have any other limited Spongebob related items that nobody has seen yet? Was there any other Spongebob media there, like booklets or pamphlets that haven't been scanned yet, similar to that original press kit which is still lost? What was the atmosphere like, and was the crew from the show there? Unearthing a never before seen picture of Steven Hillenburg and friends from 1999 would be such an awesome thing to see all these years later. But unfortunately, there's just no record of content from this event anywhere. And if it wasn't for this towel, nobody from the general public would even know it took place. You could argue that it should stay that way, as it was never meant for anyone except those employees. But as those same employees get older and more of Nick's past is uncovered, it would be nice to add this piece of Nick history to the record books, and get more insight about it. I think this mentality can be applied to most areas of Nick media as well, even beyond the media itself. We're saving as much of this content as possible would be a benefit to preserving its past. 
I'm glad that this yearbook exists, and wish there had been a whole collection of them for every year. Maybe the Spongebob premiere party would have even been mentioned in a book for 1999. I remember my copy of the yearbook also came with an employee newsletter from around the same time, which documented some of the upcoming shows and conference meetings the studio had together. And even just this piece of paper alone tells a story. I know that something like this is made with a business intention in mind, but if Nickelodeon really didn't care, they wouldn't have made it look this nice. It would have been a black and white photocopied paper without any photos or artwork. But this is just so high quality, it really shows a level of care the studio had. For that reason, it's great that they preserve the past like this. And hopefully, more eyes can be put on real life documentation too, along with the media itself that we all know and love. So until topics like this and more rare Nickelodeon lost media can be found, they'll definitely remain a mystery. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Look forward to special releases all month long to celebrate my 15th channel anniversary. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.